realize. Okay, so a very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all in this uh, Catrex Symposium East Chapter. And uh, in this, we have our chairpersons, uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, who is the president of AIOS and director of services uh, at Sindhavaside, New Delhi. Uh, we have Dr. Harman Slal as uh, another chairperson who is the president-elect and director of Delhi Eye Center and co-chairman Department of Ophthalmology, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, uh, with, with me, uh, we have Professor Namta Sharma who will be joining shortly, who is the Honorary General Secretary of AIOS and uh, Professor of Ophthalmology at uh, Central Ames in the cornea cataract and refractive surgery services. And of course, Dr. Ajay Paul, who is the director of BBI Foundation, Kolkata. And we have four speakers, uh, Dr. Satyajit Sinha, who is uh, uh, director and senior consultant ABI Institute, Patna, and he'll be talking on planning cataract surgery in uncontrolled diabetes role of NSAIDs. We have Dr. Nidhi uh, Gajendra Gadkar, who is Senior Consultant, Cornea, Cataract, and uh, Refractive Surgery Services at Kashyap Memorial Eye Hospital, Rachi. She'll be talking on cataract and post plasty eyes. Then we have Dr. Swaroop Kumar Roy, who is Senior Eye Surgeon, Cataract and Glaucoma, Himalayan Eye Institute, Siliguri. We'll be talking on challenges in underwater eye well delivery. And uh, Dr. Doyle Viswas, who is uh, a Senior Consultant, Sushant Eye Foundation and Research Center, Kolkata. And she'll be talking about <clears throat> so, um, before we uh, actually start, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Arbans Lal. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Okay, madam has joined. No, no, we request Dr. Arbans Lal to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Fine. Sir, Arbans Lal, sir, can you just uh, say a few words before we actually start the symposium? Ma'am, would you like to say something before uh, I'll contact with us? Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, uh, and it is again a pleasure to uh, be a part of this cataract symposium, uh, uh, an initiative which is taken by AIOS. And I'm sure we are going to have uh, great talks. I think, Rajesh, we can start. Please, you can call the next speaker. Okay. Okay. So, uh, sir, join in, sir. Okay, okay. So I request Dr. Harbans Lal sir to say a few words and then we'll start the session. <clears throat> Dr. Lal sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So we have this Catex Symposium uh, uh, East chapter. So uh, we just want you to start the session with a few words. And then we'll start the talks. I think that's a very good concept uh, started by the IUS and Elargan. And uh, we really are looking forward to excellent program by the East Zone. And they are very good speakers. So I'm sure it will be very beneficial for most of the listeners and the time to come because it will be there for a very, very long time. So thank you very much, Elargan. And we look forward to this uh, symposium. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Ajay Paul to take over and uh, start the proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. I'd first invite Dr. Satyajit Sinha. Uh, his topic is planning cataract surgery in uncontrolled diabetes, role of NSAIDs. Yes, over to you, Satyajit. And once you finish, we could have some lively discussion, especially the role of NSAIDs have become so important in or routine cataract surgery also. Earlier it was left to only for uh, these difficult cases like diabetes or UVITs. So let's hear from you, Dr. Satyajit. He is a prolific speaker from Patna, as we all know, from ABI Institute. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajay Paul, sir, for the kind introduction. I'd like to thank AIUS for giving me this opportunity. My grateful thanks to Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, Dr. Namrata Sharma, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, and Dr. Rajesh Sinha. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. And you can see my slide? Yes, yeah, yes. you can see your slide and we can hear you. Clearly. Thank you so much. So I'll be talking about planning cataract surgery in uncontrolled diabetes 
and uh, one thing which i would like to request all the attendees to uh, note that we will be talking about uncontrolled diabetes not only who are having a, a higher level of sugars and then getting at control now diabetes uh, as we know is uh, india is becoming one of the major capitals in the world uh, as far as the diabetes is concerned and especially with after this uh, covid has happened the incidence of diabetes is going to increase more with the use of steroids so now generally in this uh, uh, we see that wherever the per capita income is higher the incidence of diabetes is higher even though in this slide as we see in the state of bihar the incidence of uh, diabetes is lower but i think it's pretty much under reported so we have to be very careful and i'm doing a research uh, on uh, literature research on the endothelial cell loss in uh, di uncontrolled diabetes and there was very limited literature that i could find uh, regarding this so diabetes mellitus is one of the major diseases worldwide and the prevalence of diabetes has risen significantly in the past several decades and post covid the incidence of dm has risen many folds recognition of clinical manifestations of diabetes on the cornea is very important for the development of treatment strategies especially in cases where ocular surgery is needed now cataract surgery is associated with endothelial cell loss as we all know and uncontrolled diabetes mellitus it used to be a contraindication not anymore but for refractive surgery nevertheless diabetic patients who undergo cataract and lasik are at significantly higher risk of developing post operative epithelial complications although one of the major complications of diabetic eye is diabetic retinopathy corneal diseases can not only develop in diabetic patients but are also difficult to manage because most of the lasers and all that the uh, retinal surgeons have to do they have to get a good view and for that the cornea has to be in good health for them to do a good laser it is known that neuronal abnormalities directly affect the visual function in patients with diabetic retinopathy but they may also be the cause of corneal changes in diabetic keratopathy the findings of the anterior segment in eyes with diabetic keratopathy are more difficult to visualize than those of the posterior segment when we are busy in our day to day uh, uh, regular opd sometimes we can miss subtle signs signs which are there in the cornea in patients especially with uncontrolled diabetes although the cornea may appear disease free in diabetic patients marked biochemical and ultra structural abnormalities alter its uh, altering its functions can be present now we will be talking more about the endothelial cell loss the diabetic neurotrophic keratopathy is a component of diabetic polyneuropathy and recognized to be the cause of morbidity of the cornea in diabetic patients in addition corneal endothelial cell damage can cause disturbances in the management of proliferative diabetic retinopathy before and after the surgery because of endothelial decompensation with bullous keratopathy the early diabetic changes of the anterior segment include endothelial changes such as desmets membrane fold and pigment deposits in the endothelium there have been only a limited number of studies that have focused on the importance of corneal diseases especially in uncontrolled diabetics endothelial cell dysfunction may place the cornea at greater risk of developing endothelial decompensation with bullous keratopathy diagnosing diabetic keratopathy at an early stage will help initiate appropriate treatment for preventing further complications this will this we all know have, we have been seeing since our postgraduate days a scheme or by advanced glycation and products accumulation and their effect on the corneal tissues ages accumulate in diabetic corneal cells and induce nuclear oxidative dna damage and finally the corneal cells die by apoptosis on the other hand ages accumulation enhance collagen cross linking black spots enhance the ages accumulation in the corneal tissue now this is a scheme of endothelial cell dysfunction in diabetes hyperglycemia reduces the activity of sodium potassium adenosine triphosphatase of the corneal endothelial cells this leads to morphological changes of the cells which progress to corneal decompensation now patients with diabetic keratopathy have impairment of epithelial basement membranes epithelial wound healing is compromised epithelial stromal interactions endothelial function is compromised and the nerve functions are also compromised in these in these patients 
the corneal disorders associated with diaptic keratopathy are characterized histologically by subepithelial deposits thickening of the subepithelial basement membrane and altered morphological appearances of the corneal epithelium and endothelium there are not only ultrastructural changes throughout the cornea but also alterations of the tear film in diabetic eyes resulting in ocular discomfort burning and foreign body sensation the severity of the tear film dysfunction is significantly correlated with the severity of the diabetic retinopathy a greater tear film dysfunction in eyes with more proliferative changes of the retina this is something which are coming in newer uh, literatures which show that the tear film dysfunction is associated with proliferative changes in the retina it was suggested that one or more of the following events may lead to the alteration of the tear film and ocular surface of diabetic patients and that could be due to the chronic hyperglycemia corneal nerve damage and impairment of insulin action patients with diabetes had diabetes had less nerve fiber bundles in the cornea than healthy control subjects possibly due to the presence of polyneuropathy these findings may account for the decreased corneal sensitivity in the diabetic patients due to epithelial dysfunction patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy are at increased risk for developing corneal disorders such as epithelial defects recurrent epithelial erosion decreased sensitivity delayed reepithelialization abnormal wound repair and increased susceptibility to injury and ulcerations there is increased corneal thickness has been reported in diabetic patients however the exact cause is still unknown there are several possible explanations such as inhibition of the endothelial pump increased stromal swelling pressure by a given thickness or increase in the endothelial permeability several studies on the corneal endothelium in diabetic patients reported a decrease of the cell density with polymegathism and pleomorphism however the percentage of hexagonal cells in diabetic patients was not significantly different from that in non diabetic patients now protecting the ocular surface is crucial in diabetic patients due for phaco surgery because diabetes affects all the components of the tear film the use of artificial tears lubricants are very important especially during post operative period it is necessary to carefully examine functional disorders in diabetic patients suspected for the diabetic keratopathy including disorders in the permeability of the corneal tissue before ophthalmological procedures such as cataract surgery even on the day we are doing biometry it is very important that we do a uh, a random blood sugar because corneal thickness is increased in sugar levels above 300 mg per deciliter and this in effect can turn in uh, can affect the biometric calculations and uh, it's also very important that perioperatively we use topical non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs to prevent macular edema uh, as a prophylaxis following cataract surgery the role of perioperative non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs used in cataract surgery recently uh, recent literature establishes the efficacy of a newly available intracamular phenylephrine nsaid combination for pupillary midriasis post operative nsaid used for preventing cme in certain high risk populations and post operative nsaid for controlling pain and inflammation and especially in diabetic patients we have to be extra careful about the macular edema however in further uh, however further high quality studies are required to determine long term effects of perioperative nsaids on visual acuity and cme rates it's very important that when you are using um, uh, uh, operating on a patient who has sugar levels above 200 mg of deciliter that time you should get a special consent form signed It's While AIUS CME series says that two, uh, you should be operating below 200 mg per deciliter. In some studies in uh, American Academy of Journal, they have said in clear corneal uh, phaco emulsification surgery, it can also be done below 300 mg per deciliter. In conclusion, I would like to say that chondroitin sulfate and sodium halonate must be used in all patients with uncontrolled diabetes undergoing phaco emulsification. and tear films also must be used post operatively uh, tear drops and uh, a random blood sugar test must be done in all patients on the day of the surgery also especially who we know have uncontrolled diabetes thank you so much for your patient hearing and we would like to welcome all of you to patna on 6th 7th and 8th of january 
for the AIUS midterm conference, which is due to happen in coming January. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Satyajit. That was a real extensive. I think we have the Konya specialist here and Dr. Harban Slal also here. Uh, I just asked the uh, Konya person, Dr. Rajesh, now having heard all the problems that can lead to the keratopathy on the cornea, uh, you know, you, you, there are a lot of changes, both epithelial and the, so how do you uh, see those patients? How do you uh, identify those patients that these are the patients which are susceptible to you know, diabetic, a long-term diabetic patients, you know, or, or PDR and all of this, that this guy is going to have a cornea problem, even if he doesn't complain of, do you do some special test for diabetics for the cornea? Uh, not really. There's no special test as far as the cornea is concerned. Except the clinical ones? Uh, yeah, uh, only the clinical ones. And the second thing is that we want to see whether the diabetes is well controlled or not. And if it's well controlled, then uh, any past history related to, uh, you know, uh, uh, corneal symptoms or anything. Then specular count we would like to do. We would like to see what is the endothelial status. The second thing that many times happens is that if you do a little bit of manipulation, the surface, then they can be, because the hemidesmosomes are weak, so there's chance of epithelial defect in these patients. So, uh, and plus, of course, uh, post-op coronary edema can be high because of the altered morphology of cells. It's not just the number of cells, but it's also the morphology of cells that, that is more significantly altered in diabetes. So, if there's a significantly significant alteration of morphology then in such cases we have to take all the precautions in any case we take all the precautions but we have to be extra careful in using chondroitin sulfate while doing the surgery we have to go be a little deep we don't have to you know you have to be careful not to take the nucleus into anterior chamber and then emulsify we have to do in the back phaco so all these things <clears throat> go slow but not very slow also otherwise if the long surgical time then there can be again a uh, high chance of edema. All these cases, they have sometimes the risk of uh, DMD as well. So, <clears throat> just some extra precaution and a bit of uh, pre operative planning helps in uh, preventing these uh, corneal issues. I think the one important point is if you are doing a, a topical FACO, these patients should not be given drops. Uh, just before the start of the surgery, not that in 5, 10, 15 minutes before in a preoperative room, anesthetic drops, because that can cause epithelial edema if you start too early. And we start anti-inflammatory in all the patients before surgery and after surgery for a week at least. And uh, you also, uh, anti-inflammatories are good, I mean, and I said, but you also have to keep watch if these, any of these patients are developing epithelial toxicity or so, so you need to stop them. And the, the incision uh, is the one of the most crucial thing when you do a diabetic because they are more prone to infection also. And if there's a chamber fluctuation and other things. So incision at the end of the surgery incision should be well, well close, well close. These are one of the indications wherein I would like to prescribe uh, post-operative preservative-free lubricants also in all the cases. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That you, you, would you pre-treat all diabetic patients with some lubricants thinking about the uh, about the say uh, the patient has an NPDR or not much of a uh, retinopathy changes but expecting some uh, uh, retinopathy changes post cataract surgery where we are not an NSAID before along with the lubricant and how long would you continue these NSAIDs uh, normally there are many those susceptible patients it has been recommended for two or three months so would you do that Again, thinking about the diabetes having a, a corneal problem also. Yeah, uh, I would like to use NSAIDs for eight weeks and uh, and uh, lubricants as well, lubricants for a little longer. And uh, mm, yeah, these are these patients are not only susceptible to have a posterior issues like CME, etc., for which we prefer giving NSAIDs to prevent that. They are also prone to develop the surface problems. So yes. Uh, so normally, normally if the visual recovery is not so good. I mean, if the patient vision is six 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 nine, but patient is not very happy about his vision, 
So I think uh, most of us have got OCT in our clinic. So I do run the OCT and see whether there's any uh, mildest macular edema over there. So if there's any time patient is not feeling happy with the vision, even if the vision is six, nine or so. So I run the OCT and of course, if there's a, any edema, then you've got to, you've got to continue with the anti-inflammatory. And if the, within a month or six weeks or maximum two months, if it doesn't respond, of course, you have got to use the anti those Sir, what is your comment about this uncontrolled diabetes patients? Uh, we, we offering them uh, premium IULs because at some stage they, they may develop a diabetic retinopathy even if they haven't had it at the time of surgery. So what is your suggestion about uh, premium IOL, sir? So the, the, if patient does not have any diabetic retinopathy, then you can actually go ahead and uh, use the premium IOL 1. Two, in my experience, uh, if the patient has a diabetes for say more than 20 years or 18 years or so, and if he has developed no diabetic retinopathy, then there's very remote chances of his chance. diabetic retinopathy because most of these diabetic retinopathy develop between 10 to 15 years <laughs> of uh, duration of diabetes. So older patients so may be prevention by sclerosis or whatever may be happening. So a very old patient who has got uh, diabetes for 20 years, no diabetic retinopathy, I think uh, there's absolutely nothing to worry. And in a younger patient, because now there's a good medication available and which can control the... Uh, side effects of the diabetic retinopathy and if the patient understands that he has to be careful about controlling his diabetes, I think you can go ahead and use the multifocal. But if the patient has got a very young patient, erratic lifestyle, I mean, uh, the, the type of job they do these days, they drink every alternate day, they are traveling every alternate day. If it's in that type of a work, I will really, 35 years of age, when he starts making money and he wants to enjoy his life, I think those patients are a little dicey, but older I patients will be, be more comfortable than using in a very young patient with a wrong lifestyle. Yeah, coming to uh, Satyajit's question, whether to go in for premium IELTS, because more and more patients are coming for premium IELTS. I think toric is not a problem, though toric is yeah. not considered a premium. But I think the, the lenses which you know uh, decrease contrast sensitivity, you know all the ring lenses, whatever brand or whatever, so as against them, there are lenses now, the so-called advanced monofocal. So I, if the patient wants, I think we could go in where in future, there are chances of lowering contrast sensitivity patient develops diabetic. But that's not a problem because I mean, there are talks who say that, uh, well, by that's putting true. a multifocal lens, you are not losing it. Whatever will happen with a monofocal and that will happen with the multifocal. The problem with multifocal is that it is already lowered contrast sensitivity. So, the slightest degree of retinopathy would lower. So anything that would lower, I think I would avoid at this point of time. And we have those lenses now coming up, future. So otherwise, I think that's okay. Yeah I, guess, yeah. yeah, I guess there are three things actually. One is glycemic control, how good it is. Second, I'll take over from what Lal sir was telling, that if somebody, a 50-year-old patient has come to me with diabetes, having, say, mild, a little bit of uh, one or few uh, microaneurysms, and uh, he's 50 years old. Uh, I will think about, uh, uh, I won't put a multifocal lens in that. But somebody who's a 65 year old with a few microaneurysms and having a reasonable good uh, uh, glycemic control, I will go ahead because he may live for another 10 15 years. By the time he will have severe PDR, etc., if, even if the glycemic control is not good. But somebody who's 50 years old, the risk of having diabetic retinopathy by the age of 60, 65 will be much higher. So that is one consideration that I put when this, while deciding about premium. Yeah, I think again, uh, Satyajit put up a point where uh, what is the blood sugar level? I think AIS has a directive that 200 milligram and then I think that this is the first time I heard that is special consent. First time I, I mean, there were, these are one of the conditions. But there would be patients, quite a lot of patients who are not controlled below 245 or 270, 280, prolonged diabetes, uh, the HbA1c doesn't go below 8. How do you, I mean, that was a good suggestion or I think that is that there in the AOS guideline that take a special concern for anybody above 200? Uh, actually, for me, 200 is actually too low a cutoff which has been given by EIS. Yeah, and uh, my personal cutoff is 250, 150, fasting 150 and PP 250. Reason is... Many times there is a stress induced. I mean, the patient checks in the morning at home, blood sugar level is all right. He comes to the clinic for operation, his yeah, blood yeah. sugar level goes up. 
So one is that if the patient has got the blood sugar level uh, which was controlled and comes and if it is uh, 250, up to 250, I mean 255 to 56, I'll go ahead and do the surgery. And if the patient has got a problem in traveling, patient is very bulky, they can't bring it time and again, I will go and operate even up to 300, 350, 400, 500, whatever is the blood sugar. The patient has got a difficulty in commuting, a difficulty in coming, coming from the far up places, and the, they have tried their level best and diaptologist is not able to control, patient is reluctant to use the insulin. So if there is a patient who has got a chronic defaulter, always maintains a blood sugar at a 450 or something, I will definitely go in. And particularly if he has got a mature cataract, more or less in both the eyes. So it is on a, a compassion ground that the patient should be able to see and if he's not able to control and if he's not able to change his lifestyle because of the obesity. So I will operate at any level of blood sugar. Uh, but normally, I keep my cutoff at 250. Okay. And that, of course, depends the patient's distance he has to travel. I mean, the patient has come past 200 kilometers away. The patient is next door neighbor. So even uh, you can really ask him to come again. So we have got to take a lot of uh, things into consideration. And many times, uh, uh, you can wait for some time. By the time your list is ending, maybe a sugar actually comes down. I'm not very strict about this. <clears throat> and there, there, are, there are reports that okay, there is no correlation between the arthritis and control of the blood sugar. There are enough of reports. Only thing is that if patient develops tasks or heavy inflammation, you need to give a stride which can make his blood sugar go haywire. So arthritis is not so directly related with the blood sugar level. I mean, there are reports that you can operate at a higher blood sugar level. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those lovely inputs. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Alban, sir. Uh, can we move on? I think we're already 6.30. So uh, can we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Nidhi? Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Nidhi. Please. So is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah. yes. Screen is visible and we can hear you. Uh, a very good evening to all my seniors present here. And thank you, AIOS, for uh, inviting me to be a part of the symposium. So I will be talking about cataract and post keratoplasty eyes. Now, cataract surgery, as we know, can, can be done after an optical keratoplasty, after a therapeutic keratoplasty, or as a combined surgery in a field graft along with endothelial keratoplasty. Now, the indications obviously is diminution of vision. The ideal timing would be after all the sutures are removed. However, we can plan the surgery early if there's an intumescent cataract or the cataract is very advanced. If there is uh, trauma to the anterior capsule during the primary surgery, progressive shallowing of anterior chamber or raised IO. So the challenges that are faced in post keratoplasty eyes is that uh, the patient might have a compromised optic disc or a concurrent posterior segment pathology, low endothelial cell count, the graft hose junction always is a weak area, there is a risk of viral reactivation, low visibility, irregular anterior chamber which is mostly shallow, uh, difficulty in IOL power calculation, high astigmatism and the cataracts can be complicated. Preoperative planning is very important. Uh, uh, calculating the IOL power will be a challenge. And uh, whatever type of IOL is planned, a backup PMMA rigid IOL or a three-piece IOL should be kept. Peribulbular block should be given very slowly to prevent any graft hose junction dehiscence or a subtenance block can be given. And in selected cases, preoperative mannitol should also be given. If the patient has had history of viral keratitis in the past, then the surgery should be planned under antiviral cover. Counseling, again, is very important uh, for subnormal visual outcomes, residual astigmatism, need for spectacles, contact lens, or additional procedures, risk of graft rejection, graft failure, or viral reactivation. Intraoperative planning, uh, we need to use an endothelium protective uh, soft shell technique. Uh, intraocular fluid should be BSS or BSS plus. Pupils many a times are not fully dilating, so iris hooks or other pupil dilating devices should be used. There might be a requirement of pupiloplasty and a backup vitrectomy in case of any complication. 
During the surgery, uh, we need to minimize the fluid turbulence in the anterior chamber. If a FACO is uh, being done, then the IOP should be lowered as well as the aspiration flow rate. Uh, anterior capsule should be stained with tripan blue and sometimes uh, retroillumination or endoilluminator assisted capsular excess may be required. Post-operative management again is very crucial. Uh, topical steroids should be tapered much slower than the regular surgery and then eventually they are continued. Additional oral steroids may be given. Judicious use of NSAIDs and lubricants. Adequate post-operative cycloplegia, adequate IOP control, and always watch out for any sign of graft rejection. Talking about the incisions, uh, in little larger grafts, we can also open the junction of the graft hose, uh, the graft hose junction for the main incision as well as the side port. Whereas in smaller grafts, it is easier to uh, make the incision on the hose side. Sometimes when the grafts are very large, that time clear corneal incisions can also be made. So this is a case uh, post keratoplasty four months, uh, cataract was advanced and anterior and posterior sinicae were present. So I planned the surgery while the sutures were on. Many a times when the posterior sinicae are released, uh, there's an inflammatory membrane. After removing that, adequate uh, pupillary dilatation is achieved and the surgery is quite easy thereafter. Absolute excess, uh, again, can be done under retroillumination or sometimes even an endoilluminator assisted Rexis can be done. Here I'm using the illuminator externally only. So this is one case example. Uh, this is a, a case of a patient one night operated for optical PK around eight years back. Uh, specular microscopy, we could not get any morphology, no cells were detected and the cataract was advanced, almost brown cataract and pupil was non-dilating, had pseudo-exfoliation as well. So here uh, I planned to do the surgery with iris hooks, but uh, there was a lot of posterior sinica and no place to place the uh, hook. So first I did the sinicolysis and tried stretch pupilloplasty. And sometimes uh, this itself works and then the dilatation was adequate. So I thought not to use the iris hooks. After removing the inflammatory membrane, uh, always we need to stain the anterior capsule again, else the visibility will be very poor because first time only the, uh, the membrane gets stained. And the rexus size again should be adequate according to the grade of the nucleus. This was at day seven. Uh, the graph was clear. BCVA was six by 12 and IOP was well controlled. Another case of a 54 year old patient who underwent tectonic keratoplasty. The graph was eccentric. Patient was doing well. He was planned for a suture removal, but then uh, he missed a follow up and came with a very high IOP and intumescent cataract. And thus, before suture removal, first I planned the cataract surgery. So here I was more comfortable with SICS because of the eccentric graft and the superior uh, region had the graft hose junction. So I made the incision a little superior nasal. Side port incision also was made such that uh, it did not interfere with the graft hose junction. Now while doing SICS or FACO, we need to take care that the incision that we are making does not cross or dehisce the graft hose junction. Nucleus delivery can be done with a vectus or viscoelastic assisted, whatever is comfortable uh, to the surgeon. But other all manipulations should be only done via the side port to avoid any anterior chamber collapse. Thank you.
It's important to always suture the ports here because uh, the host cornea also does not have that much of tenacity to hold uh, such large incisions. This is at day 14. Uh, BCVA was 6 by 12. IOP was much controlled uh, with anti-glaucoma. And, but by that time, the disc had compromised a little bit, was 0 0.6. And the specular count was also satisfactory. Another complication which can happen uh, with sutures or without sutures is graft host junction dehiscence and excessive manipulation and increase in IOP even with the sutures caused a dehiscence here which would which re can require more than one sutures. So that needs to be taken care of while doing manipulation. Another case uh, of a patient who underwent tectonic keratoplasty and uh, the iris was excised, there was a large iris defect. She again was planned cataract surgery later, but came with an intumescent cataract and thus uh, planned to do the surgery early with the sutures on. The surgery was uneventful, but I thought that the iris defect can cause an optic capture or uh, can uh, cause imbalance uh, in the IOL. So I tried to pull all the iris and cover it over the optic at least at least 0 0.5 mm but because of the deficiency of the iris it was not possible so a simultaneous pupilloplasty was done here a single uh, fourth row technique was done single pass fourth row There was an iridodialysis inferiorly, so I could not uh, repair more than that. But still, postoperatively at day seven, uncorrected vision was six by twelve, not improving. Uh, well controlled IOP and the op, uh, the IOL was very much in place. Graft was okay and uh, SFT was in place. So uh, this can be done concurrently with the surgery, and sometimes uh, even when we have a normal. Uh, uh, as in cataract surgeries, due to long-term dilatation of cycloplegics, there can be an optic capture. And this can lead to a lot of glare and uh, chances of the uh, haptic also coming out. So a sequential SFT can be planned in such cases, which also gives good results. So to conclude, uh, Cataract surgery post keratoplasty might be challenging, but careful preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care can give us good results. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. It was a wonderful a plethora of cases that those challenging cases which you have managed, and especially so. Before we start the discussion, I think Rajesh, Dr. Rajesh, should. Uh, add something to especially the biometry part when you have the sutures on versus i mean uh, the sutures are already off and patient uh, the eye has you know stabilized to a large extent the keratome and the corneal curvature has stabilized versus the ones that you had to put in with the sutures on yes dr rajesh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> very nice uh, presentation nidhi uh, wonderful cases and uh, i must say that um, <clears throat> Apart from biometric, first of all, just a couple of things I would like to add here that we should try to avoid the graft host junction at all costs, either go in or go out, but uh, avoid the graft host junction. That is one. As far as the biometry is concerned, uh, yes, ideally speaking, we should always do it after removal of complete uh, all the sutures. But there are some scenarios wherein, as she showed, that if there is an intermittent cataract, total white cataract, in such a case, if we have to do it, then uh, <clears throat> we have we we cannot think of implanting uh, premium IOL. We have to implant a spherical IOL only and a monofocal IOL. And uh, therein we have we can calculate based on the axial length and whatever biometry we are getting because we cannot do any change. Uh, we cannot think of any other parameters. Now th there are ways of doing it that if somebody has a record that how much astigmatism he gets after keratoplasty in his say last 100 cases and i mean the, the, these are theoretical things actually 
practically speaking, uh, it is very difficult to say because it also depends on many other factors. That if you have done a full thickness keratoplasty, what was the indication of keratoplasty? Again, for in that for that reason also, the astigmatism will vary. So all these things are theoretical. So we have to consider that only. We have to think about the spherical power correction and later on. Uh, <laughs> If there is any significant astigmatism after removal of sutures, we can handle it later, uh, depending upon uh, on the cornea or uh, um, uh, piggyback lens or whatever. So these things can be done. But when the sutures are intact there, we have to do that way only. That is so, uh, Nidhi, I got one question. I mean, uh, if you do the keratometry before removal of the suture and after the removal of the suture, so whether before removal of the suture, cornea is steeper or flatter? I mean, once you remove the suture, does cornea become flat or is steep? So um, that depends on how uh, central the graft is, how eccentric the graft is, and uh, what was the preoperative astigmatism. Many a times because of coupling effect, uh, even the steeper will become flat, but the flat can change so uh, i i uh, cannot uh, uh, no 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 my question was entirely different yeah, i'm not talking about the, i'm not talking of the toricity okay because toricity we cannot decide once there are so many sutures there okay so let's be forget about putting the tori guy well. so overall the cornea is steeper initially before removal of the suture that means when you are putting doing a biometry with side to air above right uh, you will not know one, there are two factors. One is that usually the graft is bigger than the host. So that pushes it. Secondly, whenever you tie suture, when we used to do extra capsular catheter extraction, so we used to explain whenever there is a loosening of the suture. So it becomes flatter because it, it has become a part of a bigger circle because the globe has become bigger. And whenever there is a tightening, the whole of the eyeball total has become shorter. So that becomes a steeper. Most of the surgeons will try to give a tighter suture than a looser, loose suture over there. And loose in any case, you will remove, you will not leave it over there. So the chance of when you are airing that, you remember that after removal of the suture, the cornea may become flatter. So if you need to do adjustment, you do adjustment accordingly. Like if you want to err on the IUL power calculation, which size to err on? That's it. Like when you are doing DSEC. So we know that it adds the tissue over there, patient becomes hypermetropic. So you need to use a little more IUL power approximately by adapter or so a patient you feel will need DSEC or you are doing a DSEC along with it. So you need to use little more I will power to compensate for the hypermetropia, which you are going to cause. Yeah, that, that's very true. In DSEC, we can definitely plan for it, but in a full thickness graft, wherein we have 16 sutures, sometimes we can have a bizarre result. A 10 adapter of uh, steep end uh, axis, you remove two sutures in that axis, suddenly that becomes flatter by okay. three adapters. So, so, what, so what I'm telling... Full thickness graft... Yeah, yeah. See, if there is a loose suture, it will not cause change in the keratometry because loose suture is doing nothing. Yeah, yeah. Well. But the tight suture will make the things flatter <laughs> afterwards because tightening is causing a steepening. So if you see the dimpling on the cornea on a set lamp, that means the suture is too tight and you will see the asymptotes over there. Okay, so, they, so that is what I am trying to tell you that if you are not already started analyzing you can start analyzing your electrometric values before and after suture removal so that in the future you can plan what way to put the IUL and what side to err upon. So it is not exact science, but still you will have some idea mm -hmm. what is to be done. Yeah, there is one more. Are too tight. Yeah, one so more thing. What we used to do. I mean, I am not so primarily. I am not doing a keratoplasty. But this is what I used to plan my extra capsular catheter section. I used to analyze what is happening. Mm -hmm. And what Nedi had pointed out very rightly that if we are doing a, like most of the, these were full thickness graft only. So uh, if we are doing a, a cataract surgery in a full thickness graft, we should know the exact etiology for which full thickness graft was done. If it was uh, related to keratitis, like uh, corneal scar, 
lady because of uh, say heel viral keratitis or a mixed kind of an infection in such cases before uh, we should start a cyclovir uh, tablet prophylactically in these cases because the risk of uh, recurrence of uh, herpetic infection is very high uh, after the surgery and of course the second thing is that we have to protect the endothelium uh, so um, there are two major things apart from other surprises one is failure because of endothelial failure Second is rejection because of uh, recurrence of uh, 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 herpetic infection because of the recurrence. So these two things have to be carefully uh, handled. And the third thing, as I mentioned earlier, that we should try to avoid the graft hose junction unless, unless there is a very, uh, say in temporal part, you have a very, as Dr. Uh, Lal was mentioning, that you have a very steep area. In such a case, you won't mind uh, opening up the incision and put a, Sucha so that uh, that becomes a little flatter and you get a better configuration. Otherwise, you have a very bad contour. Like today only, uh, I have a case of uh, cataract with credoplasty who has 16 diapter of astigmatism. And now this 16 diapter of astigmatism is, has happened uh, after removal of cord complete sutures, all the sutures. So now there is no suture. So, so that is a tricky this is, this, is, this is because of the waste gap created and in the cornea. So you will have to go and tighten put the suture again. Hmm. So if you put on a suture, you can see where there is a gap and now OCT is available. But at that time, we, this is how we used to analyze that if it is because of the gap over there, that that estimates cannot be corrected by removal of the suture. No, no. Because there's, it's no gap, there's no gap, sir. There's no history of that. But uh, sometimes what happens that the fibrosis, sometimes the sutures, if they are not exactly radial and slight so, uh, non-radial, it causes a torsion in the cornea. And that torsion, after a complete healing, it remains like that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Once we had yeah, one millimeter of torsion can cause 10 diopter of asymptomatism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Based, which are one millimeter wrong, and two hmm. corneas, it can cause 10 diopter of asymptomatism. So that's, of course, very much possible. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. I think it really opened up a lot. <laughs> well, overall, uh, well done, Nidhi. Excellent cases you have yeah. shown and uh, excellent surgical hand. Yeah, well very done. nice, very nice cases. Very nice, very nice videos. Discussion, especially the uh, your surgeries uh, skills were you know your uh, single pass both those. Uh, I mean, uh, you normally don't bother, which is somewhat chala gaya. People is dilated, okay. But I think that was excellent. So, uh, can we have the next speaker, Dr. Doyal? Dr. Doyle Biswas, I think she'll be going to the next stage, that's the Fakey Kaiwa. She's a consultant, a cataract and uh, a refractive surgeon from Shushrut Eye Hospital, Kolkata. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Doyle. I think you have to unmute. Yeah. Yes, we can see the slides. Good evening, everyone. And uh, it's really an honor to share space with such learned speakers. I'm not talking exactly on cataract, but very close cousin of cataract, the fake eye well, which is done to get rid of our glasses. Dr. can you make it full screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's, that's so uh, there is a spectrum of refractive surgery. We have the cornea-based refractive surgery, the lenticular-based refractive surgery, and of course the combined. And the fake will falls under the lenticular-based refractive surgeries. So in a history of fake will, the first model was made by Fyodor, Fyodorov in 1980s in Russia. And the first implant was done as late as 1993. Now, there are different types of fakic eye wells, the anterior chamber, the iris-supported fakic eye wells, but the ones that I'm talking about are the plate lenses that fit between the iris and the crystalline lens, just in that space. Now, what are the advantages of these posterior chamber eye wells and why didn't the others uh, be so successful? To begin with, they're behind the iris, which means that they're far away from the corneal endothelium. This provides excellent uh, cosmosis and it has a greater effective optical zone. Also, these are sulcus located, so they're much more stable. 
they can be removed easily, no matter what the timing, how many years later, you can remove them very simply. And there is no tissue damage, no iris damage, and they don't alter the shape or they remove the tissue as is done in case of a LASIK. Now, there are different varieties of uh, fake eye wells in the market. The ICL is the pioneer, and they are the oldest one and were well, the most popular ones. Uh, there is, of course, the IPCL from the care group uh, uh, basket. There is a Upper Swami has come up with the RIL, and now you have the latest one that is the biotech. Now, my personal experience has been with the ICL from the Star Group. Uh, I've done very few with the RIL from Upper, and I have also used the Care Group IPCL. Of the three, I am most comfortable with the IPCL, and over the last five years, I have switched over completely to using the IPCL. Now, the characteristic of the IPCL, the incision is 2.8 millimeters. It is customized according to the shape and size of the eye. The correction range is huge from plus 15 diopters to minus 30 diopters. I have done up till minus 25 diopters. Cylinder is up to minus, uh, is up to eight uh, diopters. And the, the material that is used is acrylic material and there is no porcelain uh, polymer, uh, unlike ICL. Criteria are again the usual criteria that you have for refractive surgery, age above 18, stability for at least a year. And when do you use it? Now, there are some surgeons who do IPCL or a fake eye well in whatever may be the refractive uh, status of the eye. But there are others, and I am one of them, who goes for a fake eye well only when the patient is unsuitable for a LASIK. Also, the anterior chamber depth has to be at least 2.8 centimeters, millimeters, and the endothelial cell count has to be more than 2,000 cells per cubic millimeter. Now, what are the contraindications? There are a whole lot of contraindications, but the most important thing that we look at is the anterior chamber depth, which is also one of the reasons why many hyper, there are very few hypermetropic patients who can actually undergo fake eye because as we know in hypermetropia, the AC tends to be shallow and we rarely get a patient who has an anterior chamber depth of more than 2.8 millimeters. Uh, the power range, as I mentioned earlier, was minus uh, 0.5 to minus uh, 30 and uh, astigmatism up to eight. They have also come up with a press biopic IPCL. Uh, as such, I have no experience with the press biopic IPCL. Preoperative assessment, you do the refraction. I do all my patients, uh, I do a cycloplegic refraction of all my patients. Uh, the anterior posterior segment examination, anterior chamber depth, again, that is one of the most important things. The intraocular pressure and the other very important thing that you have to take measurement of is the white to white. Now, uh, the anterior chamber depth, we, uh, you can do it with the A scan. Now, depending on your machine, whether you take the depth from the external surface of the cornea or the internal surface of the cornea, if you're taking it from the internal surface of the cornea, that gives you your anterior chamber depth as it is right from the machine, you get it. If you are taking from the external surface of the cornea to the anterior surface of the lens, in that case, you have to deduct the pachymetry. And the internal anterior chamber depth should not be less than 2.8 millimeters. Now, there's something called the vault. This is measured after you have put the fake eye well. So the vault is basically, by definition, the distance between the anterior surface of your natural physiological lens and the posterior surface of the fake eye well. And it plays a very important role, as we shall see post-operatively, which is why the white-to-white -white measurement that is taken preoperatively is very important because that will dis determine your vault. The white-to-white -white measurement, you can take it with an op scan with an UBM or the digital caliper. The most accurate is the digital caliper, but you should always tally it with your other machines. If the white-to-white -white range is too short, then your IPCL also will be short, which will then lead to a vault that will be less than normal. 
and this will have a chance of creating an anterior subcupular cataract. On the other hand, if your white to white is inaccurate, it's taken more than what it actually is, you'll have an IPCL that's large, that will exceed the normal range of the lens vault. This will lead to angle crowding and thus cause angle closure glaucoma. So the ideal vault should be in the range of 0.250 millimeters to 0.750 millimeters. Now, this is the way you take the uh, white to white measurement. You can take it with a manual uh, caliper, but ideally it's done with a digital caliper. Now, the IPCL implantation, the actual surgery itself, minimum dilatation, you don't want it to be too dilated because you have to tuck it under the iris, but there should be a dilatation of eight millimeters. Anesthesia, now it is usually said to do it under topical anesthesia, but I myself do it under uh, peribulbar anesthesia because I am not very good at vocal anesthesia on the table. And I really like to stay cool and keep my patient cool. The, draping and everything else is just like cataract. Before you take the patient up on the table, the marking, the access marking is done. Now the beauty of this care group IPCL is that the toricity is incorporated in, into the lens. So you only need to mark the zero and 180 degrees and you place the lens exactly at zero 180 degrees. Unlike other lenses, you do not have to you know, dial the lens 10 degree this way or that way and you know, uh, take another marking for the toricity. The toricity is incorporated into the lens, place it 0, 180 degrees and you're done. The IPCL is injected through the injectors and uh, if you look at the IPCL, you'll see there are some, mark first and foremost, there are six foot plates, three on each side. Now this, these foot plates, they increase the stability of the lens. This is the newer version. The older version had only two foot plates and was a little unstable. But this version, which is called the version two, has three foot plates on either side. So the stability is much more. They have these holes which allow the, uh, the pressure to be equal on both sides and also allow the Pisco to come up. The newer vision has a ver uh, the version two has come up with a central hole. So now we don't need to do a PI prior to surgery because you can take out the visco through the central hole. And there are these two extra holes at the junction of the aptic and the haptic. And these two holes determine your alignment of the lens. The alignment is very simple. The surgeon always sits at the temporal end, temporal side of the patient. If you're doing surgery in the right hand, right eye of the patient, the two holes have to be on your left hand side or the superior quadrant of the eye. And vice versa, if you're operating on the left eye, the two holes have to be on the right-hand side of the surgeon or the superior quadrant of the eye. And if the vault is upwards, you cannot get go wrong. Your, eye, your lens will be perfectly placed. So uh, again, putting open the cartridge, fill the injector with the saline and with your visco open the IPCL container, lift the IPCL very gently with McPherson forceps. It is a very fragile lens. You don't want to damage it. Check the orientation of the IPCL, very important. I usually place it on my palm to check the orientation and then place it on the cartridge and put the cartridge into the injector. The folding of the lens is very, very simple. Another reason why I prefer the IPCL to the ICL. Surgical technique, you do parasynthesis, put viscoelastic, I have the video, so I think I'll proceed with that. As you can see, the marking has already been done here. And uh, I like to, again, check the marking and make it a little darker because sometimes with all the cleaning and everything, the marking becomes a little light. So I'm checking the marking. They're almost perfectly done. And uh, that is my paracentesis. Uh, this is one of my very, very early cases. And believe me, during this stage, I used to be really a little jittery while going here because despite the fact that you know you have a good, deep anterior chamber, it's a myopic patient, there is still that constant fear that you have, you know, the virgin lens below and the absolutely uh, pristine cornea above, and you just have so much space to do your work. So uh, making the clear corneal incision, and uh, you know, the amount of visco that you put in should just be adequate. Don't put too much of visco. Ideally, it is said you should put in visco till you see the very last uh, 
thread of the visco. Do not let the threads, uh, you know, sort of disappear. Be there till you can see the visco. Uh, this is the lens. Lift it up very gently with your Macpherson. Try not to touch the optical area. Check for the orientation. I always put it in the palm of my hand and check for the orientation. This is the injector. See that it is inside the grooves that no part of it is above because if you close the injector and any part of it gets stuck, it's stuck there, it's, as I said, it's a very fragile lens. So during the movement, it might just crack. And when you're closing the injector, uh, listen for the click sound. If there is a distinct click sound, that means no part of the lens is caught there, it's in the groove. Uh, after I put it into the injector, I always check to see that the movement is free, that it's not stuck anywhere. So on both sides, I check to see the smooth movement. And once I'm sure about that, again, as you can see, I'm putting in some uh, visco, but as I said, this was my early cases. You really, really do not need to put in so much of visco. And here I'm going in and very slowly pushing in the lens. Now the technique of pushing in the lens is that you do not push it in in one go. You push, you stop, you push, you stop. This sort of helps the lens to unfold very slowly and you watch for the unfolding. And at any stage, if you suspect that, you know, your lens is going to topple over or it's turning, you can just take it out. It's very simple to take it out and then reinsert it again. So this is the technique of doing it, push and stop, watch for the lens to unfold. And as you can see, the two holes, this is the left, um, uh, this is the, the two holes that were there. It is now on the right-hand side on the superior quadrant. Mm -hmm. And I'm going in with the lens tucker and very gently pushing it in. Now, what has happened in this case is that, you know, uh, it's, the iris has sort of, uh, it's not exactly as much dilated as I would have liked it. A little more dilatation would have helped me in tucking the lenses quicker. Uh, but so I'm having a bit of a struggle here, but I'm able to do it uh, quite comfortably. And uh, once the, uh, the uh, haptics are tucked in, you just have to ensure that, you know, it is aligned. There are three markings on the, optic haptic junction that has to be aligned with the markings that you have made previously. And now one very important step, and that is to take out all the viscoelastic. You have to be very sure that every bit of viscoelastic has been taken out. Otherwise, this is going to go cause a rise in pressure. Unlike in cataracts, sometimes, you know, a little bit of viscoelastic left behind. It doesn't cause such a, uh, such a lot of damage, but here you have to take out. So I watch for the last thread of viscoelastic to come out and then I still wait and do a little bit more of uh, aspiration. And then just like a uh, cataract case, you just close your wounds and that's it. So a refractive surgery is a very, very satisfying surgery. And as one of my patients has said that, you know, they for it's a routine surgery for a refractive surgeon, but it is a life-changing experience for a person who has been wearing glasses like minus 13, minus 15, minus 25 for most of our life. And then to be able to see without those thick glasses in front of her is really, really life-changing. Thank you so much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. A refractive surgeon you are. The, the, the positivity that you have showed that in this presentation, I mean, you have shown everything that's possible in, in a IPCL or the fakey chiral. I think I think a lot of users now we have IPCL users all over the country. So anything to add, Dr. Rajesh? I would like to ask you something, right? Uh, like you said, uh, one or two key points that the pupil has to be dilating. You felt that, I mean, you were brave enough to show that, I mean, it looks very easy. Just push it and go in the lens, you go in. But then if the people become small or by some way I mean, you have a mid dilated pupil, do you put the leading the end right under the iris and then try to do it? And number two, what this will ask? I think people would think that putting a helon is or any high molecular viscoelastic versus the low molecular, the common methyl cellulose. Uh, 
Yes, please. Yes. Doel? Me? You ask me? Yeah, uh, let's, let's hear Doel and then uh, Rajesh will okay. come. Uh, okay. Yeah. First about the viscoelastic, I would prefer low molecule viscoelastic because if you put in helon, yes, your AC is formed and everything, but while removing it, if you're not able to remove it at one go, the entire molecule, then you could be in a bit of trouble. And uh, actually, with experience, what I've found is, as I told you, this was my initial cases, so I put a lot of viscoelastic, but you do have a very deep chamber and, uh, you know, that huge amount of viscoelastic, you really don't need to put in. So, uh, with experience, I don't think viscoelastic plays you know that great a role in sort of uh, you know uh, keeping the chim chamber deep or anything. But the other thing is uh, about yes, when your pupil uh, constricts, it becomes a little difficult. Uh, what I have, uh, what I try to do is I try to put in the visco above the lens, especially where the haptics are, and then I go right up to the end and dip dip the haptics. You know, dip the haptics and sort of dip it and push it under the lens, under the iris. But yes, it is a little difficult, takes a little bit of maneuvering, takes a little bit of experience, uh, but it can be done. It can be done no matter how much your people constricts. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Rajesh, okay. any, anything to add? Yeah, I would like to add one thing that if the pupil has become small intraoperatively, then in that case, I have described a technique of bimanual implantation of fecic implant, which I have just, uh, we have a good case series and a large number, and we sent it for publication to JCRS. So what we do is that at the optic haptic junction, uh, we uh, with the, say, left hand, I will uh, uh, use the Sinsky hook to engage the uh, perioptic hole. Hold it and bring it towards you and then tuck the haptics. Very easily it will go underneath. Similarly, on the uh, on your side, that is on the temporal side, you hold it again, the periodic hole, bring it towards the nasal side and then you can easily tuck it in. So by my, this is the technique of biomanual implantation of fake IOL in a, a small pupil, in a intraoperative meiosis. This is one. Uh, <clears throat> number two, yes, uh, Viscoelastic can be used, anything can be used. Some people prefer Helon or whatever, but I use methyl cellulose. And over the last uh, uh, few months, I have actually stopped using viscoelastic. I do hydro implantation of uh, pegic implant. Initially, I used to do it for toric, uh, for, for spherical. Now I've also used it for toric and for RIAs, for, uh, for uh, Icryl, Biotech and IPCL, everything. Uh, I have used... Uh, uh, this technique of hydro implantation, it works very well. The only thing is, one query is that, uh, although I've done it successfully, but one query is that if you have to rotate the lens, there is no cushion between the fakic implant and the, the lens. The, uh, zone use. Zone use. Zone use. That's what is bothering. Yeah. So in a toric lens, whether I can advocate that, that is something uh, like I have, my paper was presented in... Uh, uh, last uh, ESRS also, but I have put only the spherical lenses. Now for rotation, although the rotation is hardly required in ICLs also because uh, cylinder is incorporated in ICL also, but only thing is that you just have to rotate one or two degrees or five degrees to uh, adjust because you don't have that much of inventory. But these Indian companies, uh, the hydrophilic acrylic lenses, they have so much of inventory that they can provide you the exact. That's why you these are called smart uh, uh, implants, smart fake IOs. So <clears throat> that is one thing which I still am not sure whether I can advocate that you put the fake implant and when you are using the hydro cannula, the cannula is not going beneath the uh, fake implant. No, it's above that. So whether uh, rotation will, I can advocate that I'm not sure. But yes, for spherical implant, very easily you can put it because it helps in tucking the foot plate very easy. You just uh, divert your fluid towards the foot plate and that foot plate and you just handle it, it will immediately go inside. So tucking the foot plate is very easy when you are doing hydro implantation. The only thing, as I said, that I have done toric implants, but whether I can advocate that rotation, if it's significant rotation of five or 10 degrees, whether I, ad, I can advocate that, I'm not too sure. Because for that, I need to know that whether the zonules are getting damaged by that or not. Or not, yeah. And whether it's rubbing against the 
against Absolutely. the uh, yeah. anterior lens capsule. That is that yeah. normally way. it will not. It will be on the zonules only because it yeah. is. So what so is there? Yeah. So so mostly uh, there is some risk of uh, damaging the zonules if you don't have a cushion of viscoelastic when you are rotating. Yeah, just a question again to uh, Dr. Doyle. Is there a, a difference between the vault of IPCL versus the ICL, the international one? Is there, is there a curvature I, more? I, or I, the vault is more in case of IPCL. Yeah. The vault is more and they claim that that is one of the reasons why it's also safer. Uh, uh, safer for not, cataract versus safer no, for no, glaucoma? And vault is more, two, two but no, 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 one minute. They say that the vault is more, but it's, it's more transitional the version 2 the if you if you compare the version 1 to version 2 you would okay. see the version 1 was much more flatter as uh -huh. compared to the version 2 but uh, they are saying that as compared to icl it is more transitional that is okay. what they claim yes sir Raban, sir yeah i i will only have, i think i'll only comment one thing that uh, as a ophthalmologist once in a while if the things go wrong you should be honest with the patient because I had removed one eye cell which was put upside down. Iris was totally bound down. So after removed the eye cell, pressure was 45-50 with the maximum medication. Then did the trabeclectomy, then did the cataract. I'm sure the surgeon must have realized that things have gone wrong. Just didn't know how to handle that patient because the cost of the eye cell is quite expensive. I mean, if you're going to remove, who is going to bear the cost? So even if you have got to pay from your pocket once in a while, you are uh, operating so many patients. I think you should be very, very full to the patients. And if the implant uh, has to be sacrificed, please do sacrifice and do whatever is required to be done. So I'll come in here one minute. Uh, no financial <laughs> interest here, but this is another reason why I prefer the IPCL. They actually give you a backup lens. Uh, the patient pays for one lens, but they send us two lenses. So if for any reason, and I usually on the table, the surgeon is able to detect if no, that, the that, that lens is, has uh, turned. And uh, if it has, has, you can take it out. But I also know of cases where the lens, uh, it turned and it was there for a week. And uh, luckily there was no cataract formation. The vault was only 50 microns. And it was taken out, and again, that backup lens was put in. Yeah, so Indian companies that way, I mean, even if they need you need different power and different size, they will make it uh, complementary for you. I don't think there's any problem with the Indian companies. Anytime you are using their products, mm -hmm. they'll be more than happy to do that. So but but no even problem. these columnar lenses, sir, it can be removed very easily. You hold not in the middle of the footplate, hold on one side. So just pull it. Uh, what I explained to my resident is that you can't pull it so you just hold it on one side, it squeezes and by holding and uh, reholding, you just take it out. It is not, you can re-implant and... No, I know, I mean, I mean, just saying that in all the surgeries as a surgeon, I think uh, anything goes on, you must inform the patient immediately. Absolutely. I mean, there's no Absolutely. point, whatever surgery you are doing, you should be truthful and honest to yourself, it will be peace of mind. And patient, I mean, unnecessary patient will not go through severe complications. One you, thing I like to add, because ICL is a cost is involved. Yeah, yeah. You really get worried ki whether the patient will pay for the second ICL Absolutely. or not yeah. going to bear the cost. Because the surgical fee is less than the cost of the ICL itself. Okay. That becomes a little dicey. So <laughs> even then, even if money is going from your pocket, you should be truthful to the patient. That's your Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Doel, for that lovely insight into the whole world of Peki Kaiwal. So we go to our last speaker, Dr. Swaroop. Dr. Swaroop Rai is a prolific surgeon from up north of Bengal. He is from Siliguri, from the Himalayan Eye Care Center, a prolific surgeon over there. So he'll be talking, adding to what Dr. Rajesh was saying with hydro implantation. He is putting, putting the hydro implantation after cataract surgery, which most of us have now and a part of our practice. And we know the advantages, especially in the toric eyewells and all those uh, premium lenses. Yes, over to you, Choro, please. Uh, my screen is visible? No, not, not yet. yet. Huh? Uh, I think... You haven't shared it. You haven't shared it. No. It is not yet shared.
Yeah. That's good. We can see it now. Yeah. Uh, so as uh, Ajada was saying, uh, nowadays, uh, I think many have adopted uh, high well implantation under water, no, in not using visco, but uh, there can be issues. Uh, I'll go through some of small clips of videos and let us see if there are uh, issues involved there. Now this, carefully see there is a break uh, in the uh, cartridge. Can you see there is a break in the cartridge and water is rippling out. So in these cases, sometime you may have this tight eye well in the cartridge can hit very hard on the other side and it can even sometimes cause issues like injury in the iris or injury in the uh, or PC rent even or equitator injuries all can be there. Now see carefully this one. You see there is a, uh, a shooting of the eye well and you can appreciate the posterior capsular stress lines very carefully. See? So this actually may lead to a, a PC rate and eye well can drop even. This case, luckily nothing happened. Now, the loading of the eye well, you no, know, is not proper sometime. Your leading haptic is just pointed like a gun. You have to rotate carefully, uh, a, a skilled hand actually get away with all this, but sometimes learners, beginners can have problems. So in that case, you did not to go and uh, put this eye well, if you are not sure that you'll be able to put. So beginners actually should do that cases under visco delivery. The eye well after the windsat can rotate like that. So this can sometimes cause some injury in the cornea, back of the cornea. Uh, but your second instrument, that is your irrigation port, that is on the other hand, should guard. As for example, here, once the eye well was trying to rotate, as because the leading haptic has not gone in the bag, and the second, that is the irrigation port has not supported the eye well very well, and then you can have these rotations happening. Uh, and, and you can uh, stop the irrigation for a while. The rotation will stop. I can just show as the rotation started, the irrigation now, uh, yes, stop the irrigation, the rotation stops. So you can go ahead now with the surgery. So I will can flip. Uh, you can notice here that your the irrigation port is little bit away from the eye well. So there is a chance that time that the eye well gets flipped. But you can get away in many cases without any problem, but there can be issues. I will show. You have to guard with the irrigation port. Even if there is a tendency of rotation of the eye well, clip of the eye well, you can guard and guard the uh, cornea also. You can get away. But even then, rotation during this time, no, you see the haptic may be rubbing your cornea. So be careful in these cases. Don't be very much uh, daring. You must uh, put a viscoelastic and, and protect your cornea well. Here, the eye will flip, you can see, it's quite a bit, almost full. The, the trailing haptic is yet not unfolded. So there is a chance yet you can do maneuvering. This can come back. You have to be very, very careful that you do not rub cornea. If you feel there is a problem, then you must not go ahead, put a piece of elastic and do. Here you can see the eye well flipped and the even this haptic have unfolded. So when there is engagement of both the haptic, 
gone in some places there you cannot route it you cannot flip back it is extremely difficult so it is always recommended that you put these elastics well and then you can well maneuver this put in the place here sometime i will implantation if you sometime you think that this has stuck the uh, in the irish it has not gone in the bag in the first go and this haptic this is hydrophilic lens so this haptic sometimes touches cornea and can cause problem so in these types of haptic you no know, you have to be very careful uh, putting these eye wells under water sometime your trailing haptic may remain outside sometime difficult because the ac is collapsing sometime the water comes out little bit of difficulty can be there you have to be very sure that leading haptic has gone in the bag now see it has it was not gone now it has gone to the bag so it is sometime confusing the haptic has remained outside this happens mostly in wound assisted deliveries and it is sometimes difficult to put in this trailing haptic and once your uh, the uh, people is becoming smaller at ac maintenance is poorer because of the leaking wound so many a time you have to struggle quite a bit so do not wait put uh, viscoelastic very nicely and then go ahead with the surgery too much of struggle will cause lot of problem there in this case as the optic haptic junction has just stuck the iris patient squeezed and the whole pupil became small and the eye well remained vertical and the it is disengaged from the wound as it has been disengaged the eye well automatically became flat but this has caused a line of endothelial injury here where it was stuck in the vertical position so this can be dangerous in many patients so in topical anesthesia it's also a issue like this water delivery is also an issue and you are taking chances in many patients so you may have to face such a problem in many cases i will stickiness can be bothersome sometime uh these are some of the issues you always face but this is not a big issue this you can wait for 30 second 40 second time and get away with this stickiness it goes but here is a case <clears throat> this is a little bit longer video i'll shorten it see this uh, haptic has stuck on the uh, behind the optic behind the optic i was trying it was under water delivery i was trying to disengage and detach this attachment with two instruments on so both the irrigation aspiration port used viscoelastic now and tried with two separate instruments of spatula and the sinski hook and made the eye well vertical and gone in between this uh, this junction in the gap between these two to de uh, detach this attachment it is so stubborn that it is not getting detached it is so so difficult i it took about 3 to 5 minutes time see you can see it is literally uh tearing off as if i am tearing off the i will it is not coming out yet this is a uh, acryol ec i will that i implanted and from that experience i have avoided using this no doubt this has happened because of the increased stickiness they have put in the back of the eye well so that the pco rates are less but this has caused this a problem 
because the IVL, uh, the, the cartridge uh, loading sometime can cause, these are cause, these are loaded by the assistance most of the assistant most of the time. So you may land up such a problem. I think you can appreciate such a struggle that I had to do and it is not yet opened yet. Now this is the time, this is last part. Now it has released. So upside down the lens has been made and then it has gone. So, so difficult sometimes. So underwater delivery can be even bothersome in these cases. So the main thing is put in the cartridge inside. It is better to put, uh, be in the inside and guard the eye well with the irrigating uh, port and then put in the eye well. In this type of haptic also see the leading haptic call has gone well in the inside and guard the eye well before it unfolds and then you can tuck it to the bag. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shorup. I think showing us those plethora of cases actually shows the prolific surgeon you are and your wide uh, you know, experience in dealing with this and how you have come. I think the last slide showed it all the simple trick how to, I mean, the beginners, how to get through that, especially guarding it. And I just add to that, at, just at that moment, I would put the irrigation just off. I mean, the beer would come to uh, foot switch almost zero because if I have that, and that moment, as it is opening, you just allow it, and then again, get the, uh, the irrigation on. Then you see that the lens has gone and settled in the bag, and then get it. And the second thing, uh, the manipulation that you are doing, I think over a period of time, I've learned that the irrigation is on. Instead of take the aspiration in the right eye, you can just take the, just say, uh, not the Sinsky or uh, the lens manipulator. It becomes much easier, especially the haptic going over the iris and you're trying to, you know, uh, push that with the aspirator. Instead of that, just the, 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 um, the eye will manipulator, one of the manipulator, just hold it and take it and it work. But then you have really shown the whole plethora of cases, and especially those sticky lenses, that can be real sticky in case of irrigating, putting under irrigation. Uh, any comment, yeah, Arman sir, and we yeah, have Satyajit uh, also. I, I think uh, one is that the second hand you are using a rounded irrigation port, which I use usually tumble dialer, uh, which you can Absolutely. engage at an optic haptic junction very easily for rotation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Secondly, like in a um, handshake technique, when my IUL haptic, uh, trailing haptic comes on the end of the tip of the uh, injector, I use the irrigation port at that time and guide it then and there into the chamber. Yeah. And if I feel there's any problem, I just place it onto the dexterous margin and just press it down, it gets slipped inside. And uh, while injecting this uh, hydropolic IUL, you need just 50, 60 centimeter of bottle light. You don't need 100 so centimeter. Much of yeah, so that this uh, actually you are able to uh, control the rotation and the shakiness of the IUL better over there. That's just one or two points. But otherwise, overall, uh, very overall good. Overall, it is. And uh, I'll take leave somebody's at my home. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, bye-bye. You, you almost <laughs> come to the end of this program. And I just add a little bit, but in the, the chances of the lens tumbling and floating in the anterior chamber is mainly in high myops. In those cases, actually, I put the, just before putting, I put a little bit of visco inferiorly in the pointing and let the lens go in. And once that goes in, I press it, then the visco anyway escapes. The visco is not behind the lens. Actually, guiding and keep it in. It's only in those very high myops so, that so, it becomes so, very so In my all cases, I do not allow the chamber to collapse at any stage of the surgery. That means when I finish the irrigation aspiration, before I withdraw my aspiration port, I always inject some amount of viscoelastic on this side port so that the chamber is maintained throughout the, this thing. So already there is uh, some amount of viscoelastic, which is very small, and but uh, uh, then you, it comes out by the time the lens goes in without any aspiration. Yeah, before we end, uh, would Dr. Satyajit like to add anything? I just wanted to share my experience, what I had today. Uh, I was using a high-end injector system, which has come recently in the market, in which you uh, it has a button which you press, and the lens starts moving by itself. Uh, the Alcon, the Alcon lens, the Alcon auto lens. Yeah, and, uh, I had given high promise to the patient, 
and it was a plus eight diopter lens. I don't know whether the thickness of the lens had to do anything, but the blue uh, uh, pushing uh, stick, which is there, the injector, that went over the eye. Over the. And it has happened with me also. I've been using Clarion two three every day. First time it happened. that it went over the iul and then i did not know what to do uh, there is no way you can uh, pull it back or do anything then my ot assistant said there is a flap on the top you just open it and then uh, take out the lens and then uh, use another in injector and put it in so that was one experience which i wanted to share because i i was just panicking that after finishing a high myop uh, feco emulsification nicely i was not able, i was not being able to put the iul so even that can happen clarion i yeah, I, yeah. i did not yeah, anticipate yeah. that this happened to me 6 months back after that i always have a simple iq as a backup for <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah. it happens to me anyway but my ot assistant opened it very nicely yeah, I know, the right. end part yeah. and took out the lens and uh, yes but very nice video sir dr swarup yeah. sir very nice video very very thank nice thank you video. Very, thank you thank I mean, you you have something like 20 videos i i don't know how many even more that maybe 20 30 videos you had been sticking you have and so i think we are dr rajesh is not here dr rajesh yeah. are you here no no yeah yeah i'm here uh, uh, yeah 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 very, so, very nice videos to add to and, and uh just one thing uh, with whatever experience i have what i feel is that when we are doing hydro implantation the direction of the fluid matters a lot so if the direction of the fluid say if we are sitting it should be in inferior angle towards the inferior angle like if we are doing temporal then it should be on the nasal angle so that the chamber is well formed and plus uh, if the direction is towards the center then it may flip the io so that is one thing which uh, i have felt uh, that's be done otherwise it was i mean uh, very good cases wonderful very interesting ones and very nice videos so i must congratulate and i would like to thank uh, <coughs> dr ajay for uh, you know moderating the session very well so if we uh, are done with the discussion then maybe yeah. can i do the beauty of yes, thanking sir. everyone thank you so well so big thanks to the chairman dr harman lal and of course moderator dr ajay paul who really brought out some very pertinent questions very interesting uh, presentations all four presentations were so crisp and so good that uh, you know this uh, webinar was very interesting and we had a wonderful discussion thanks to dr ajay so thank thanks you. to all the speakers and would like to thank elargan for supporting this webinar so and i would like to thank all the audience all our colleagues who have participated in this webinar and making it successful so thank you very much and hope we will see you see you again very soon in some other yeah. uh, thank event. you thank you dr rajesh thank you thank you thank you ld one we hope to see you more and more in the aws for more times to come and there's a thing yes. now also Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.